<clears throat> All right, this is the pre class video for class number 15. It's the third and last class on Hinduism. And we are going to talk about Hindu art. And we're going to talk about women in Hinduism and then the environment, Hinduism and the environment. So you were required to read the chapter on women. Um, the chapter on the environment is optional. Um, but anyway, so let's start with the art. Then you can think about in your own mind, how much of a role does art play in your life? And how about the art related to your religion? If you attend church, then the traditionally, all of the art was related to religious worship because art was the sensuous path. It uses sensuality to get you to spirituality. So it uses something tangible or something auditory, something where your senses are used, but it tries to get your mind to focus on the realm of the spirit. So again, you can call this religion or you can call it spiritual humanism because we are wired to seek something greater than ourselves. So that could you call it, could call it this is what humanity is. It's natural, or you can call it uh, something beyond what's natural. If you think what's natural is just physical, well, yeah. Um, so however you define these things. All right, so I'm gonna start out with some slides um, and explanations of the slides. So this is a case, an example of how you're using the sensual to lead to the spiritual. And specifically in Hinduism, the physical world is maya, illusion, and what's real is the jiva inside of you, right? So you have to turn away from the physical toward the spiritual. Now, um, the way this art works is that it takes something, stone, huge stone, right? That looks like the most inert, dead, unspiritual uh, material you could possibly imagine. But they take that, it appears, stone appears to be not spiritual. And then they sculpt it and turn it into something that's spiritual, leading you toward the spirit. Um, another, the way that it's sculpted is that it's busy, right? It has a lot of stuff on it so that you start thinking more in terms of activity. Um, also, it's pointing upward and it has these circles. So that is symbolic of you have these cycles of life, these reincarnations, and eventually the goal is to be liberated, right? To escape rebirth. And when you look at it, it's a projection of what's inside of you. So you look at it and it's going like that and you project inside of you, you go inward in that same, you're trying to focus inward on the jiva inside of you. So the external image reflects the internal reality. You have layers and layers of maya and then you get to the center. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's the second one. This is uh, Arjuna, the story of the Gita, had four brothers, and there probably is another, a fifth little temple here, but each temple represents one of Arjuna's brothers who fought in that great war that the Bhagavad Gita is describing. And that's the war between the cousins that um, Krishna told Arjuna he had to participate in because it's his spiritual work, spiritual dharma is the path of action to release negative karma and get the universe focused 
on positive karma. So Vishnu, if you remember, is the preserver. Brahman is the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and um, Shiva the destroyer. So Vishnu comes to earth in order to get human beings back on track. And so that's what he's doing. He's coming to earth and he's speaking to Arjuna and telling him he needs to get the universe back on track. Um, so again, you have the same, the same cycle of life and pointed um, roof, but not all of them are like that, right? Some of them are different. Each brother is different, has a different character. This is the circle of the sun. So um, the sun and moon have served as the wheels of the chariot on which either Vishnu or Shiva would ride and fight against the devils. So, so this is the struggle between good and evil played out as a struggle between the gods and the devils. Um, and that's supposed to reflect inside of you, right? This stuff is symbolic, at least, you know, the Socratic interpretation is that it's symbolism for the struggle that goes on inside of every person's psyche. So that's the um, circle, the wheel of the sun. This one is the, the celestial dancers. They dance um, and serve the Amrit, which is a drink that makes the god immortal. And, um, and dance is another important uh, art form that was connected to religion. And the way the dances work is that they have very intricate hand gestures and body. I mean, everything you have to train to do this. It's highly skilled a dance. But the point is that the dancer would get in touch with the jiva. She would just get in the zone. And that, that would be her way to use dance to go from sensual to spiritual. This is um, from Sri Lanka, which is where Mr. Wichitanga and um, Dr. Irosha are from. And each one of these represents a different incarnation of Vishnu. So Vishnu has incarnated nine times and is planning there's another incarnation to come supposedly but one of his incarnations is as an elephant <clears throat> and one is as a horse. So that's what, um, that's what, and, and a tortoise. Another one is a tortoise there, up there. Um, the tortoise was the second incarnation. The elephant um, is one of the secondary ones. And the last one is a white horse called Kalki. Now, even though this is a secondary one, um, the festival to the uh, elephant god is um, one of the big celebrations. So that's probably why it's a major player there. This one is <clears throat> on many, during many wars, Brahma, the god of creation who has four heads, has acted as the driver of the celestial chariot for Lord Vishnu or Shiva to fight the devil. So again, we're into this big, the gods versus the devils, um, the struggle between good and evil. This is a temple um, to the Lord Shiva. He resides there with Parvati, his second wife. She's the reincarnation of his first wife. Um, and this is a huge temple. So look at how, how big this is. It's enormous. Okay. And so that's a temple to Shiva. Um, this is the dance position of Shiva. Um, and it means Lord Shiva dances a special dance called the Tandav after he takes poison. It's still performed by expert classical dancers. 
It's very sophisticated, needs a lot of practice and athleticism. And if you notice, he's dancing on top of a baby. Well, that baby just represents Maya. So when you're turning toward the jiva, the destructive part is you're destroying Maya so that you can more clearly get in touch with the jiva. Okay, this is Kali, is the supreme goddess who comes to the rescue of gods when even Lord Vishnu and Shiva cannot rescue them. She's the source of all energies. So I think this is interesting because if she's the source, then it's it's before, before um, Hinduism, for tens of thousands of years, there was goddess worship. Goddess worship started 35,000 years ago. So you can, so this was, developing right so kali is still the the source of all the energies is a woman but then um if you know that what emerges are three men and then they have their female consorts and then it goes forward but the biggest hindu festival which runs for more than a month is is worshiping her um okay so this is Vishnu reincarnated as a um, wild boar. That was one of his incarnations. Um, half boar, half man. Um, okay. This one is Vishnu incarnated as Krishna. And Krishna played the flute. He used to play the flute. And it said even the animals and trees used to stop and listen to him play the flute, sort of magic. Um, there's a serpent sheltering him. Um, I think I might have cut that out of the picture. But anyway, the serpent um, is, okay, that's also a god, the king of the serpents. And the serpent has a thousand heads. So uh, once again, the serpent is the symbol of goddesses. So now they're, you know, they're co-opting the goddess main um, symbols of the goddess and integrating it into their own Hindu view. All right, the next one is, oh, this is a picture, another way of understanding creation. And what it is, is Vishnu is lying down and Brahman, Brahma is coming out of his navel. So that's, and everybody's celebrating. So the universe is coming out of the navel of Vishnu. But again, if you remember, it didn't really matter. You can envision creation in any of a number of ways. So, um, so the point, the the issue there, you can think about your own experience with art and or religious art. Um, how much of it is based on sculpture? How much is architecture, the building you go in? How much is music? How much is dance? Um, how much is, um, well, let's see how many different, anyway, all the different, well, paintings. Um, and then there's, of course, literature and plays and performances and um, all, of the, all of the ways that we express ourselves through art. So how powerful is art? How much, what sort of role does it play in your life? I think I'll ask you, you know, each of you to, to say which art forms and which pieces of art perhaps have influenced you the most in your life and whether you think art plays an important role. And is it a spiritual role or in your life, has it become just secular? That would be an important question is that, do you think of art as a, as a path to the spirit or do you think of it as just secular? It's what you do when you're not in church. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go to the article on women. It wasn't very long. And I did scan it for you in case you were supposed to buy the book, but all right. So 
some of those stories, if you can tell, um, Cal Parvi was uh, the original, the source of all the energies. And because religion is spiritual, it should not be gendered. There's nothing gendered about the life of the spirit. The life of the spirit is immaterial. It doesn't have body parts. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, participate in different functions related to reproduction. Um, but it gets corrupted. So religions get corrupted by the culture. And so what happened was um, Hinduism emerged and then the code of Manu was uh, constructed by religious leaders. And it's very, very sexist. That's what you read in the first couple pages of the reading. It demands that women be subservient, they have to obey, and they are constantly being surveilled. So um, the doctrine of incarnation, reincarnation was used to justify women's oppression. Uh, women are just younger souls. And if they work at it, if they're good wives and mothers and they don't create bad karma, they'll be reincarnated and maybe they'll even make it <clears throat> into the body of a man <laughs> if they're good enough. Okay. Um, the other, I mean, you know, you can argue so that this book has the arguments one way and the other way. On the one hand, it's sexist. On the other, on the other hand, maybe it's not so sexist. So um, it, it advocates honoring women. Now, the issue there is whether the Hindu dictates about how to treat women and this is true in all the religions, are they ahead of their times or are they just reflecting their times or are they even more severe against women than the culture? Now, I don't know of any uh, ancient traditions where in the, compared to ancient culture, the religions are, have just been corrupted by the sexism or they're a little ahead of it. So to, to say you have to honor women uh, could have been ahead of the game because um, in some, it's possible that women were just considered men's property. Okay, men are still in control, but women are supposed to be respected. Um, and we, we will see Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad advocated respect for women. Um, Jesus even treated them as equals because he talked to Mary about spiritual things. And he told Martha to come into the living room and talk about the things of the spirit. She shouldn't spend her time in the kitchen. Um, the reason there weren't women disciples is because they can't, single women cannot roam around the countryside with single men. <laughs> that was just socially completely out of bounds. Um, okay, so the notion, all right, so Gandhi actually liked this um, doctrine, this sexist doctrine. Gandhi was sexist, and Jordan pointed that out. He slept naked with two young women in late life just to test his self-control. And so when he was actually killed, when he was assassinated, he had just come out of a tent and he had these two young women um, holding him up on each side. Uh, luckily, they didn't get shot, but all right. So then there's uh, advice about how to lead a household life. And you're supposed to just accept abuse. And it's just because of your karma. Like either you're a young soul or in some previous life, you did something wrong and you're being punished by being reborn as a woman. All right, the next thing is religious practices. Um, whenever you have this notion of purification, women are always thought of as impure. Men are more pure. Sacrifice, women are asked to sacrifice. Um, and in the death and burial is a really serious issue because um, you can't, 
after you die, the theory is that you have to be um, burned. Your body has to be burned to release the spirit. But you have to have your son light the fire. And if you don't have a son, you're in trouble. Like you're not, your soul won't get released. Well, that's super sexist because, of course, then you're not going to have a daughter or you're going to keep trying till you get a son. Um, in India, more recently, um, there's been a, there isn't a one child policy like there is in China, but poor people and who are poor in India can't afford to have very many kids. And so they do um, test for a pregnancy to see if it's a girl. And if it's a girl, they'll get abortions. So there are many, many uh, female fetuses aborted in India. Um, okay, the Sanskritization is that when you're really poor, women have to work out in the field. And that's a complete insult because women then are exposed in the public and they could get raped or corrupted. They could become corrupt. And so as soon as you make a little bit of money, enough to keep your woman home, that's what you do. And then they're denied education and training. And they're also married off at a young age. Now, my students at Asia University for Women, um, I have students and I, I can't remember if they have to do this, but their mothers, whenever they have their period, they have to go and live in a hut uh, in the backyard or something, because they're impure. And I know I have students who during their period, they weren't allowed to touch people. They weren't allowed to touch dishes and stuff. There were just this, these customs of associating menstruation with uh, impurity. They still exist. Um, and then a lot of my students, um, most of their peers have arranged marriages. And so women have no say in who they get married off to. And that's true for Muslims too. It's just really um, still very pervasive and certainly pretty unacceptable to anybody who cares about women's equality. All right, so then there's another book, The Duties of a Respected Hindu Wife. Um, and I, I can read some of those tomorrow in class, but you should read them and come with what you think of it. Um, so in the Gita, knowledge of the one is genderless. Like um, why, remember the path of reflection? You think of God as energy. And when you're on the path of the heart is when you have to personify, but you apologize for that, right? So it's inferior knowledge to know the one in various material forms. And that's when you bring in male and female gods and goddesses. But even then, like the gods and goddesses should be equal because it's all just energy anyway. Um, all right. So in the doctrine of reincarnation, animals are also Atman. They're pieces of the jiva. Uh, and women and girls are incarnation, young girls are incarnations of the Atman Brahman. So polytheism should lend itself to being less sexist. Um, so Western societies supposedly are against idolatry, right? But they envision God as a male and they shouldn't. <laughs> um, God is not gendered. Um, Jesus, you know, the incarnation is a different story. But why would Jesus be a male? Well, because he had a mission and he had to be single roaming around the countryside. I mean, that wouldn't be because it's male is superior. That would just be because of social norms and expectations. Okay, so the female Hindu goddess Kali is a popular image as both male and female. Then the doctrine of nonviolence is a big thing in Hinduism. 
um, but it was um, never institutionalized into practice. So what happened again, as soon as a, as a religion gets institutionalized, as soon as it becomes part of a culture, it gets corrupted. So then you have the difference between personal nonviolence and structural nonviolence. And this is important because it's what we were talking about at the end of the day on um, last class is about racism. There's personal racism and then there's structural racism. And again, I, I just wanted to say to my students, because I talked about it at the end of class, that it's only since COVID hit, I decided to read a lot of books about things that I didn't know about, that I felt like I ought to know about. And one of the first books I read was called um, uh, the, let's see. Anyway, it was about housing and um, race. And just for the record, I was so shocked and I was um, the color of race. I was embarrassed that I got to the age I am without knowing this. So I definitely want you to know this. You should know it. Um, is that after World War, before World War I, there were lots of jobs preparing people for the war, fighting in the war, whatever. And so <clears throat> um, making ships, Shipbuilding was over in California on the coast. And a lot of people moved out there to get jobs, black and white people. And what happened is first they hired white men. Then when they, they needed more jobs, they hired white women. Then they, married, they uh, hired black men, even though black men would be the heads of households and white women would not. And then black women. That's number one. Black people, for no reason other than racism, didn't get hired. Then the jobs they got hired for were the worst jobs. Then they were paid substandard salaries. Then maybe the main thing is they weren't given housing. So the government built housing for white people. Most government funded housing is housing for white people. It's not what we associate now because we think of housing projects. I don't know. I think of it as Chicago and that's almost oh, that's heavily black. Um, but that is not the way it is. That's why it's so important to read because you can't look with your eyeballs. You have to look with your mind. So anyway, the same thing happened in World War II. Um, people moved out there to get jobs, same problem. Um, and then the reason, and the, okay, so Black people didn't get housing. White people, housing prices in San Francisco in that area are just humongous, right? Houses are extremely expensive. A tiny little house would be half a million dollars. Um, but just think of that. If you were a white person and you got a house way back, World War I, World War II, and then that built equity became more valuable. You had an amortized loan. You paid part of your loan to the bank and part to the equity. Whereas if you're black, you're either renting or you have a house but you, you don't get to build equity because of the nature of the loan. So you could be paying every month a loan. And then if you miss one payment in 12 years, you'll lose the whole house. So you don't build equity. Then the next thing is that you, you sell that house and move to farther out where those houses are even more valuable. So you don't have to pay for the whole house, right? You could have a house that's maybe worth $30,000 and buy a house for 40,000 and just, or 50,000 anyway. So now you've got a more valuable house and its equity goes up even faster because the neighborhoods, the value of the houses in that neighborhood go up. The richer you are, the more the value of your house goes up because the neighborhoods are, you know, uh, something 
other people want to buy into. And so then the prices go up, but then your equity goes up without you doing anything, right? So you might have bought your house for, I don't know, 50,000. But then how many years later, it's worth 300,000. So you didn't nearly pay that month by month, but the equity got built. So then you go out to a more expensive suburb and you get an even more expensive house and it builds even more equity. That's how middle-class people get wealth. And that's why it's gotta be a major reason why uh, African-Americans have, I, the last I read it was 10%, the wealth that average white people have, but that isn't because they're lazy. It doesn't mean they don't work. It, it has, at least that's part of the problem is the housing. I know that because my own family's wealth is predominantly equity in houses. That was my parents had a house. They kept the house my mother grew up in that she paid $6,000 in like 1928 or something. And then they sold it for, I don't know, 250, something like that. And so, you know, all that money they got just from keeping this old house that was in a neighborhood where the value of the houses just kept going up. And then they gave that money to all their grandkids. So the grandkids could pay back their college loans or pay a down payment on a house and get, you know, accumulate wealth in their home equity. Ah, or they could pay, they could go to a good college and pay off their college loans with the leftover equity, with equity from their great grandparents' house. I mean, that's one way that money sticks to money. And then my particular family, uh, that was a big deal. I don't have a house because when I went to Batesville, um, the values of the houses don't go up that much. And I was single and I didn't want to pay a mortgage. So I understand this from that point of view also. Anyway, so um, that's the difference between personal nonviolence and structural nonviolence. So we have these structural problems and in, and that that is really important. So I don't want you to graduate from college without understanding institutionalized, not just racism, institutionalized classism, the way that the rich just keep getting richer. Um, I'll give you one more example, which is not, it's not directly race-based, but if you're wealthy enough to invest in stocks, then every year, the value, if the value of the stock market goes up, which over time it does, um, you get dividends. You get paid back by the stocks and then you reinvest that. But it's called capital gains. You gain this money without doing anything and it's taxed. Well, since those people, the people who have investments have more money than the, than the poor, it should be taxed more than your job tax, your income tax. So the average income tax paid by maybe a receptionist at an office is 28% of his salary. Well, capital gains tax, it seems to me, because you already have money, should be um, taxed at 35% um, more because you, can afford to pay more taxes and because this is unearned wealth, but it's actually taxed at 15%, like half of the taxes paid by people who actually get up and go to work. So that's class-based violence. It's structural and then class-based violence. So I do want, I, it's very important to me that you start to understand that, those things because too much of what goes on is just immediate something you can see or some experience you've had where you really need to step back especially since you're going to be the leaders of the next generation you have to figure out how do you want to move the needle what direction do you want the country to go in what would you like to support 
what do you want to find out about? Uh, I mean, you can't do everything, but you can at least follow what's going on. So that when there are these immediate demonstrations or whatever, you understand the frustrations behind it, the way things are institutionalized um, and, and call it out. And then if you call it out and you do your best not to make it worse, that's about all you can do, but you can definitely talk to other people and keep people aware of what's really going on under the surface. Um, then another thing is the, the problem of aristocracy of soul, okay? Um, there is, religions are often used to justify class splits. Um, the Brahmins, you know, why are the Brahmins the religious leaders? Oh, because they had more incarnations and their souls are more sophisticated. And that detracts from social justice activism. Um, and then there's institutionalized violence against women. Dowry is a huge issue. For my students at Asia University, dowry was huge. And they had lots of stories of women who were seriously abused by their in-laws because they, their parents didn't come up with a, a good enough dowry. Um, and that is definitely a perversion of, um, of any kind of religious life. The bride is considered a commodity. Um, and then abortions, 95% of abortions are females because the socialization, the institutional structures favor males. Um, so also when women get married and they go to the homes of their in-laws and they are treated like slaves. And again, a number of my Asia University for women students say that happens, like that's the norm where they come from. Um, and then a lot of girls because of that commit suicide. Um, sometimes women are murdered, it's called um, kitchen fires so that the husband can marry another wife and get another dowry. Um, and then there's that ritual that the son delivers the father from hell. And so if there's no son, the father ends up going to hell, which good grief, what a way to, to lead to a bunch of abortions of females. Yeah. How do we overcome these traditions? Well, first of all, you have to interpret karma as personal responsibility, not fatalism, not something that you don't control. You are just, you know, it's because of your past that you're a woman, or it's because of your past that blah, blah. Um, all right, and, and don't move so far away so you're so isolated in your in-law's house that if something happens, you can't go home, you can't uh, contact your parents. Women, oh yeah, the notion that women are polluted, male, men fear women's power of reproduction. So they call it polluted. They call it everything so that they can control it. Um, the solution is education and training. There were women Hindu priests. This is true in a lot of traditions is the most independent, educated, um, women who exercised authority within their own um, monasteries, they were religious women, right? Virgins, um, it's true in Catholicism, it's true in Hinduism, Buddhism, that the most advanced, educated, progressive um, women were Hindu priests or priestesses. Um, there's two kinds of sacred texts that which is heard through revelation, and then that is which is remembered and written down. And this is true, remember the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Jesus said, I'll write the law in their hearts. And then you can make good judgments. If you purify your heart, then you'll have you know revelations that are appropriate about how to live your life. But writing, once you write something down, it's human. It's a human being that interpreted it. 
when they wrote it down. And then it's another human being who interprets what the writing down means. And so that gets really corrupted. So that's what the code of Manu is, right? It's something written down. Um, so the author of the book is interviewing this person and he thinks his mother achieved liberation. Um, and in the Upanishad, in the Hindu text, it says that scholarly daughters are entitled to study the Vedas. Um, some females were revered as, um, in, as Brahma level um, of spirituality, right? The highest level, and they were allowed to be lifelong students. And so in some parts of India, there is 100% literacy, so women are educated. Anyway, so those are the, there's lots of themes there that just keep repeating um, in all the religions that we study. And then the last one is the environment. So this shouldn't come as any surprise either that, um, that Hinduism ad, would be, it would advocate um, living sustainably, not destroying the earth, because obviously that would be bad karma. <laughs> so there's an importance of a spiritual dimension in environmental protection. So, and, and this guy argues that you can't just make it science, but you should harness religion and people's religious convictions to get people to live sustainably and to move toward zero carbon future. Uh, it provides three mainstays to cope. It defends the individual. It forces the individual to recognize their fallibility. And it, it improves moral strength, right? It's moral um, education. But it should, and it also has strict sanctions for people who violate God's creation. So. Um, environmental education is incomplete without cultural and religious perspectives. It can't be just science. It has to be that you want, right? You love the earth or you revere the earth. It isn't just that you have your number crunching. Um, all right. So there's a debate about uh, religion and the environment. And so Lynn White is a famous guy who said Christianity is to blame. Uh, for this environmental destruction, but there was destruction in non-Christian nations, and there are Christians who advocate the um, covenant relation with the earth. There's nothing in the Old Testament that would require you to interpret it as we're entitled to exploit the earth uh, until it's destroyed, and then God will come. God will either come to prevent that or God will save us. And it was God's plan to have the end, uh, the end times. That's not, <laughs> that is a very poor reading of any kind of uh, truly religious orientation because the cause of our destruction is greed. And there's no religion that advocates greed. And it is the cause, like there's no other cause other than human greed. Um, so Hindus were respectful of the environment until the West came. So it wasn't, even though Hindus now exploit it, it was not their um, orientation. The sanct life is sacred in Hinduism, all of life, right? Um, you can't damage other species. And that's why so many Hindus, of course, are vegetarian. Um, God's creation is, um, so the creation is just, you know, an emanation of the spirit. Uh, the Vedas, the creation, maintenance, and annihilation of the cosmos depends upon the supreme will. We have no special privilege. We have moral obligations. We have duties to the animals and the birds um, and the flora. Uh, I mean, even the plants were and trees were worshipped. I have a friend from Indonesia and his, his little village he came from was named after this huge tree. And um, the tree was, was sacred. 
it was, but that was also a Muslim. Most of the people were Muslim, but their old tradition was Hindu. And they actually, um, they had a lot of Hindu customs, which they had just integrated with Islam. So they don't pray five times a day, but they worship the tree <laughs> and they're Muslim. So whatever, that's, that's the connection between culture and nature. Um, pollution and prevention in Hinduism. So they have to deal with these issues. Cremation of dead bodies, sanitation. Oh, air pollution is terrible. So I can't go to some big Hindu cities. I always wanted to go to those cities, but the air pollution index is so bad. And I have trouble with that. I had trouble in Indonesia. So they also have trouble with um, pollution of the rivers because people go to bathe in the river because it's sacred. Um, how about the caste system? Well, the caste system degenerated, right? The West corrupted it and it, you know, it was degenerate because it got people, you know, if you're in the upper caste, you're not going to let your children go into a, a lower caste, even though the system itself says every child has their own spiritual dharma, their own spiritual calling, their own spiritual place, but parents would never allow that. So you end up with a hugely corrupt system. Um, but originally it was related to sustainable development. They used natural resources because they had so many people and they had to really know how to live sustainably. Um, and they had a lot of indigenous knowledge, indigenous practices. Um, okay. Um, so there are movements of defense of the environment. The Chipko movement is big, and that's where they protect the trees. Um, and there's feminist movements. Each tree has a tree god. Um, forest Satangrai. Uh, Graha, remember that truth force? So it's forest truth force, just like they got that from Gandhi or Gandhi got it from the tradition. Um, the loss of respect for nature is a big problem. Um, India needs to revive their cultural tradition in order to get back, get to a sustainable place. Um, and also I wanted to mention there is a woman named Vandava Shiva who has a degree from Harvard, I think. Anyway, she is in a big part of a big movement in India to farm, farming sustainably. And she's very anti-GMO seeds. So she and Bill Gates don't agree. <laughs> and my attitude is, I wish they weren't just at loggerheads because I do not think moving forward, we have to have absolutely no GMO, are absolutely all GMO. Like it's not what's going to happen. And it's, I'm sure it's not what's best. So why can't she have her non-GMO farming techniques? And then in other places in the world where there aren't a lot of, uh, there isn't farmland. Maybe in more mountainous places, people can benefit from having GMO crops in the few, in the small, plots of land so that they grow more rice or wheat or whatever per inch of land. So you'd have GMO there. I mean, why can't we just be reasonable is what I think. Um, anyway, it's any sort of sort of black and white thinking, absolutist thinking, um, orthodox, the, Bible, the, the holy book says this and that's the way it is. Any, any kind of that, I don't go for it. And I don't think Hindu, if your goal is always to create positive karma, then you definitely have to listen to another person, right? And you have to figure out, well, how can I find a common ground and move forward? How can we find common ground so that we all flourish, which is in Hindu language, how can we create positive karma and avoid negative karma? So I think we're in a very similar place as we were with Aristotle and with Confucius, the great harmony. 
So I'm, I just start out with a very generic similarity. And then clearly there are the differences. Um, the US-China relations is going to be a big deal. Um, so what the politics and economics is, you would look, you would think there's no common ground at all. But, you know, I want you to know there is common ground in our common humanity. And we could move forward and promote flourishing. It's just that there's a lot of powerful rich people who don't want that. And then they use religion as a weapon, as a way to further their irrational, wicked goals. So I look forward to um, talking to you all tomorrow. I think that's it. Um, I have the Hindu Smith outline, um, Houston Smith outline, and we might finish up on that. And that's it for tomorrow. So um, I'm not quite sure how long this is, probably too long. We'll see you.